Welcome everybody. My name is Martha Johnston. I'm the Director of Education and today I'm going to be actually doing our student loan update and then I added the little title where we are today. And that's because we've been talking about student loans probably since the summer of 2020 when we first had the pandemic pause. And so I feel like we've been preparing for this moment for three and a half years, um, you know, as of the fall of 2023. So here we are, spring of 2024, and we're really gonna spend most of our time talking about where we are today. We're not going to really rehash where we were over the last three and a half, four years, um, because I think honestly, there were so many things going on, it could get confusing. And so we just want people to have a good set of information about federal student loans and where we are. So having said that, today we are going to cover Let's see if I can get my slide to advance. There we go. Uh, repay restart. That's our internal nickname for waiting for this big moment when our student loans went back into repayment. We um, created resources in three easy bites of information. Update, plan, ask for help. We are going to talk about repayment plans and tips. We're going to talk about the repayment on ramp and fresh start, which are two initiatives uh, through the current presidential administration. We're going to talk about the one time IDR adjustment. IDR stands for income driven repayment. We will talk about loan forgiveness and consolidation. I will spend a little bit of time talking about PSLF, that stands for public service loan forgiveness. And I will mention Mohila. That's the name of the student loan servicer that is handling all public service loan forgiveness borrowers who are in repayment. Talk a little bit about student loan tax benefits. And then the big picture, which is your big picture, your overall financial considerations as you manage student loan repayment. So for many of you that are here today, you might have your own student loans that you're managing, or there might be someone in your family who is managing their student loan repayment, or you just might know people who are managing student loan repayment. So um, we hope that you find this information helpful and share it with anyone that you think would benefit from it. So as I said, Repay Restart, our nickname for student loans going back into repayment is well underway. Interest began accruing on federal student loans last September 1st, 2023. And the first due dates on federal student loans since March of 2020 were likely due in October of 2023. Now, some people had slightly later due dates. Some people were put in administrative forbearances by the loan servicers. And that's because there was a massive wave of millions of borrowers entering repayment at the same time. Um, outstanding interest will be applied until paid down. And then we want to make sure that this information is easy and bite-sized so that you remember it. Update, plan, ask for help. So the first thing that we recommend with Repay Restart is to update your information. And where we want you to do that is studentaid.gov. Now, if you were in the keynote session with Myla, you saw studentaid.gov, you saw the dashboard. That is actually where you'll go in to make sure all of your information is up to date. So basically it's your FSA ID, username and password. We're starting to change that over to say studentaid.gov, user ID and password to use the new terminology. Um, and if you don't already have that login, you can create one. Um, but also, it's really important that you make sure after you go into studentaid.gov, and hopefully you already know this, but who is managing, who is servicing your student loans? You'll want to make sure you create a username and password for your loan servicer. Make sure that you know your loan amount, the payment due date, the monthly payment amount, and what current repayment plan you are on. And we will review those payment plans in this presentation. So Repay Restart, again, we said update. The next thing we said was plan. So FAME has many free financial wellness resources available to you, fame.enrich.org. If you have not accessed that digital platform, please create a username and um, ID. It's, we're not going to share your information with anyone. This is information for you. You can customize financial education information that's important to you. But for today's purposes, we want you to know there's a budgeting tool in um, Enrich. So fame.enrich.org, use the budgeting tool to help you work your student loan payment back into your monthly budget if you have taken advantage of the payment pause. And not that that was a bad thing at all. Maybe it allowed you to pay off other debt and do some other um, things. 
but now it's time to work that back into your budget. So determine and select a repayment plan that's best suited for your financial situation. Remember to enroll or maybe re-enroll in automated payments, which oftentimes will provide a interest rate uh, discount. So uh, there were a lot of student loan servicers over the course of the pandemic that switched things around a bit, if you will. Some actually left service as federal student loan servicers. So your loan may have been shifted to another servicer. In that case, your banking information didn't follow. So you have to re-enroll in automated debit. So uh, make sure you pay attention to that because you wanna take advantage of any interest rate discount you can. Make sure also that you're paying attention to any emails, calls, letters from your servicer. Be very, very diligent and also be very vigilant. If you do get a call, you're not sure you know the number, just for now, please answer it. It could be your student loan servicer trying to get a hold of you, and that's important information. Um, I will tell you, both of my children are actually in repayment on their student loans, and they just forward their emails to me, but that's because they know I use them as my guinea pigs um, so I can help borrowers. And then one other thing to be careful of, of course, is to watch out for student loan scams. And I did skip one bullet just above that. Make sure you do document all your calls or interactions with your loan servicer, especially for this first year. I mean, I recommend doing that no matter what, but with millions of borrowers going into repayment, um, it could be a little hairy, if you will. And so you wanna make sure you document all your interactions with them as they, again, bring millions of borrowers back into repayment. So the federal student loan servicers, when you log into studentaid.gov on the right-hand side, and I'll show you this in just a few minutes, you'll actually be able to see who your federal student loan servicer is. And it will be either Ed Financial, Mohila, I, I already called out that they are the PSLF servicer, PSLF, Public Service Loan Forgiveness, Aid Vantage, Nelnet, uh, ECSI. So those are the federal student loan servicers currently. The other thing that we recommend at FAME, if you haven't done this, we highly recommend that when you log into studentaid.gov that you go ahead and use the loan simulator. I've actually done this with my own kids for their student loans, but it will help you figure out the best repayment plan for you based on your situation. So you can see from what we're sharing, um, you can select whatever your situation is. I wanna find the best loan repayment strategy. I'm struggling. I want to simulate more borrowing. So maybe you're going to go on to do graduate work. So the loan simulator is a great resource available to you. In the example that we're sharing, the person selected, I'm struggling with my student loans or I'm struggling with my payments. And when they went through the loan simulator, the recommendation was that they look at doing an income driven repayment plan. And so that's what you're seeing on this screen. The different income driven repayment plans, a general forbearance is another option. A forbearance is when you say to your servicer, I'm having difficulty paying, and they place either a hold on your payments or they make a reduced payment to get you through that difficult time. One thing I want to call out, if you are someone who's pursuing public service loan forgiveness and you elect to go into a forbearance, the months that you're making payments as part of a forbearance do not count towards your 120 payments for public service loan forgiveness. I'll talk about that a little bit more later in the presentation, but if you are pursuing PSLF, you wanna be very careful about entering a forbearance. It's not that it's a bad thing, and for some people it's what they need to do to get their cash flow back where it needs to be until they can get on their feet but just know the consequence of going into a forbearance if you're pursuing public service loan forgiveness. And then last but not least, the loan simulator will also help estimate what your monthly payment would be um, depending on the results of your simulator. So in this case, based on your selections, the overall repayment strategy, and assuming you meet eligibility for public service loan forgiveness, this is the plan with the lowest monthly payment. We estimate you'll pay $0 until July of 2033. That actually is very real right now with the new SAVE plan, and I'll talk about that, but there are many borrowers right now based on the calculation of the SAVE plan who are qualifying for a zero student loan payment. Um, in this case, July 2033 represents 10 years out from 2023, so this person is clearly, or, or this fake person, is clearly trying to pursue public service loan forgiveness. So having their student loans forgiven after 10 years of eligible employment 
while they are in an eligible repayment plan, and that is an income-driven repayment plan. So repayment tips. Make a student loan debt tracking sheet, poster, post it, whatever motivates you. I actually think that's incredibly important. And I know it sounds like maybe we, we have all this down pat as people at FAME, but I do the same thing. I revisit my financial goals and it makes me feel really good when I can tick off that I'm actually, um, even if it's incrementally, heading toward making progress on my goals. Um, make sure you use any tax refunds or other found money to help reduce your student loan balance. And if there's a different student, if there's a different credit balance you're trying to reduce, maybe credit card debt, for example, that's fine too. Use the found money to reduce that. Um, but if you have that found money or tax refunds and you can help reduce your student loan balance, that's a good option as well. I really, really love the debt snowball uh, philosophy, which is you basically take your lowest balance debt and you work very aggressively to pay that off first. Now, of course, you're paying off your other debts at the same time. So maybe you're making minimum payments on those, but you're making a slightly higher payment on that small balance one. As soon as that one is paid off, then you take the money you were applying to that, and then you snowball it to the next lowest balance debt that you're trying to pay off. So the idea is that you're snowballing that monthly amount as you tick off paying those debts. Now you can do a different approach called the debt avalanche approach, which is basically you're doing the same thing, but you're doing it with high interest rate debt first. And that really just depends on the type of personality you have as it relates to money. There are some people who are like, I can't stand the concept of thinking I'm paying more money in interest. I'm going to do debt av avalanche. And then your personality could be, I have to feel like I'm making progress. And if I have to feel like I'm making progress, I need to tick off that small balance one and get it down to zero. Both ways are fine. It's whatever meets your needs. Um, you can also consider refinancing um, debt for lower rates and including student loans. But we're going to talk about the difference between refinancing and federal consolidation because that's really important. And of course, it probably goes without saying, try your best to avoid taking out more debt. And then don't forget to ask for help. If you can't afford your monthly payment or make your payments on time, contact your student loan servicer immediately. And just remember what I mentioned about forbearance. It might be that forbearance is something you really do need to take advantage of while you get on your feet with your budget. If you're pursuing public service loan forgiveness, just remember that any payment made during a forbearance isn't going to count toward your 120 payments. Now, having said that, Right now, with so many students, uh, not students, but so many borrowers, <laughs> they were students, so many borrowers being put into administrative forbearances, that is a forbearance that you did not request. The servicer put you in that forbearance basically so they could kind of get caught up and do their housekeeping related to millions of you going into repayment. Those should not count against you for public service loan forgiveness. Um, I will give you a real life example. My daughter works at a 501c3. She is um, pursuing public service loan forgiveness. She is in an administrative forbearance with Mohila that she did not request. So I will be monitoring that very carefully to make sure when the time comes, I'm not going to do it yet. If they have not made those months eligible toward PSLF, I will reach out to them with my daughter, of course, and we will make sure that those months are added back to her PSLF because they should be. Um, remember, there are numerous options available to you besides forbearance. I know I've spent a lot of time mentioning that word, but you can look at a new repayment plan that reduces your monthly payment. Again, income-driven repayment. You can also look at temporary deferments or forbearances, such as unemployment or an economic hardship deferment, and certainly half-time enrollment in college or active military duty. So there are lots of reasons why you might be able to put off paying back some of your student loans for other situations that you're experiencing. So what is the one-time on-ramp? So the on-ramp lasts for 12 months, last October 1st, 2023 through September 30th, 2024. It basically is a 12-month period intended to be a kinder, gentler re-entry to student loan repayment that was initiated by the current presidential administration. Interest does still accrue if your loan um, is accruing interest, as it would, of course, but it will not capitalize. So that means it doesn't get added back to the principal balance until the end of the on-ramp. Benefits of the on-ramp are that if you have a late missed or partial payment, it is not reported to the credit bureau. It does not count toward a default. Um, it's not referred to collection agencies. 
Um, the other benefit of the on-ramp is there's um, no requirement to do your recertification of your income-driven repayment until six months after restart. So that's right about now. You want to make sure you've done that. Um, and then the income can be self-certifying. So again, the on-ramp was meant to say, okay, millions of you are entering repayment. Servicers are going to have challenges. Many of you have not had this student loan worked into your budget for over three years. You may be having challenges and we wanna give you every opportunity to be successful and the on-ramp does that. Fresh Start is also an initiative that was launched by um, the Biden administration to help defaulted borrowers. Fresh Start is a one-time temporary program that offers special benefits for borrowers with defaulted federal student loans. It automatically restores access to federal student aid. That's actually pretty critical. Uh, data shows that most people who have defaulted on their student loans actually have rather low balances relative to some balances we've seen. And it's because they didn't finish their education credential that led to their inability to get that job to pay back the student loans. Well, then once they went into default, they couldn't access more federal student aid to go back and finish that education credential, which is so very necessary in order for them to secure a good paying employment. So the Fresh Start is intended to help people with that. The loans will be transferred from the default resolution, sorry, default resolution group. I can't speak today, I need more coffee. Um, or from a guarantee agency, whoever's holding that loan, and it will be put into a re in repayment status. So that's a good thing. Record of your default will be removed from your credit report. And you do have to contact your loan servicer to claim the full benefits of the Fresh Start program. And you do need to do that before October 1st of 2024. So you want to make sure you put that on your to-do list now to start pursuing Fresh Start if that's a situation that you're currently in. So I did mention that we would talk a little bit about repayment plans. This is a really great visual. Repayment plans really come in two types, based on income or based on loan debt. And when I say loan debt, balance, right? So based on loan debt on the right-hand side, um, standard, the orange box is what we all were familiar with. What is it going to take to get my loans paid off within 10 years? The standard repayment on student loans. Extended repayment is a little different. It says you've got a higher balance, and so you need to go beyond 10 years. And then graduated repayment basically means that your payment will start off slightly lower. It will increase over time. The philosophy being that the longer you're in a new job or in an ongoing job that you'll be making more money and you'll be able to handle that higher payment. So that's what standard, extended and graduated are intended to do to get you paid off within a certain amount of time. Um, repayment plans based on income are different. We've got income-based repayment, income contingent repayment, pay as you earn, revised pay as you earn, and now we have the new save plan. Um, so I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about the SAFE plan because it really is probably the most generous income-driven repayment plan we've ever seen. And for many people, I can't imagine why you wouldn't pursue the SAFE plan, but every situation is different. So you have to pursue the plan that makes the best um, sense to you and for achieving your goals. But let me just jump to SAFE. So the SAVE plan is really the repay plan. If somebody's in rep repay, they will be shifted over to SAVE. It's for any direct loan borrowers. It is not for plus loan borrowers, and I'll talk about that at the end of this slide. Um, undergraduate borrowers will make a payment of 10% of their discretionary income, and that will be calculated each year based on your income and your family size. Now, as of July 1st, it will drop down to 5%. So that's a great thing. And that's a change that's coming. I assume they couldn't enact it right away because they needed to give loan servicers time to get all the software programming done to handle that. So 10% was already in the system. It will drop to 5% on July 1. So basically what that means is your discretionary income is basically the poverty guideline income based on your family size times 225%. So that is actually a rather generous treatment of the income. So that's good. So that 225% um, minus what your income is, that extra amount. So if your income is 60,000 and your 225% of your poverty guideline income is 40,000, then 20,000 is considered available for student loan repayment, and it would be 10% or 5% on that. 10% if you're a graduate student, 
10% uh, if you're an undergraduate student until July 1st, and then 5%. So 10% of that divided by 12 months, and that would be your monthly student loan payment. The really big thing about the SAVE plan, I think that makes it so generous, is that if your calculated monthly payment isn't enough to cover the interest that is accruing on your student loan, as long as you make your monthly calculated payment on time, the interest will be forgiven. So I can't see why somebody wouldn't do the save plan, except we talked about money personalities, right? If you're someone that just needs to get that debt out of your mind and you wanna pay it off quickly and you can, then certainly you could do save plan and repay you know, more quickly by doing prepayment on principal. But if you're someone who needs that little extra cushion in your cash flow, the save plan is actually not going to hurt you with regard um, because you're not accruing more interest than you're able to pay. That's what we call negative amortization. So the save plan really is a huge improvement. Probably many years ago, not too many, you heard stories about people who, were, who would say, my student loans are actually higher than when I started going into repayment. And that's because the interest was accruing and they weren't able to make a payment that covered principal and interest. And the save plan corrects that problem. So, so it's a good thing. I would say for the save plan, this is what mostly everybody's going to be on, especially if they're pursuing public service loan forgiveness. And you would actually apply for the save plan by going to studentaid.gov. Um, so I'll show you pictures of that in just a few moments. I do wanna talk about the one-time income-driven repayment adjustment, the one-time IDR adjustment. Now I promised we weren't gonna go back in time and say, okay, this is when this happened and this is when that happened. But what I do want you to realize because it's active right now until April 30th, 2024, the, top, the Department of Education is conducting a one-time adjustment of IDR qualifying payments for all direct loans and any federal family education loans if they are owned by the Department of Education. So if your federal family education loan, which is an older loan, is owned by a lender, they're not part of the one-time IDR um, account adjustment. Um, it's based, so basically what this is, is it's based on an income-driven repayment plan. So were you in one? Are you in public service loan forgiveness? Or if you're not in an IDR plan, but you are interested and have direct or FEL loans, held by the Department of Education, this one-time adjustment will occur. The adjustment will be applied to most borrowers' accounts in 2024. I am already seeing this happen. So it is real, it is happening. And it will be applied only to direct loans, remember, and FELP loans, Federal Family Education loans that are held by the Department of Education. No application is needed. However, if you do have an old felt loan that's owned by a private lender or a Perkins loan or HEAL loans, those are very old medical loans, HEAL loans, um, you have to consolidate before April 30th, 2024 to benefit from the IDR adjustment. So the IDR adjustment is actually a really great way. It's basically the current presidential administration saying, okay, we recognize there were lots of hoops people had to jump through and, and those hoops didn't always create the smoothest experience and a lot of people were bumped out of eligibility. So we're gonna do this one-time IDR adjustment and we're gonna count payments that previously might not have counted. Now going forward, you're gonna to have to have payments that would count. So you'll have to be in an IDR repayment plan. But looking back, they will count payments that might not have otherwise been eligible for IDR. And the reason this is important is twofold. If you are someone who is not pursuing public service loan forgiveness, you actually still have student loan forgiveness in front of you. Now, people aren't going to like to hear this, but that student loan forgiveness will happen either at 20 or 25 years. I know that seems like forever, but it is available to you. If you're someone who's pursuing public service loan forgiveness, then this IDR adjustment will also benefit you while you're trying to hit your 120 qualifying payments for public service loan forgiveness. So the one-time IDR adjustment is really, really beneficial and important for borrowers. And it's happening right now. But if you're someone who has old loans, remember you need to consolidate your loans, federal consolidation into a direct loan by April 30th, 2024, in order to qualify for the IDR adjustment. And again, it's a one-time adjustment. Um, the impact of IDR adjustment, if you have at least 12 consecutive or 36 months total forbearance, it'll still be counted. Again, a really generous treatment of this IDR one-time adjustment. 
it will count toward PSLF. You heard me say that. If you're working at an eligible employer, um, it does include parent plus loans. They will look back as far as July 1994. There are people who, as a result of this IDR adjustment, are getting their 20 and 25 year forgiveness. It is happening. Um, and as you can see, that's what that last bullet says. So it could result in immediate forgiveness. And we have seen that absolutely happen. So other types of forgiveness and cancellation, you've heard me mention public service loan forgiveness a lot. There's also teacher loan forgiveness, public service loan forgiveness, you're making 120 eligible payments um, on eligible loans. So those are federal student loans owned by the Department of Education in an eligible repayment plan. So you have to be in an income driven repayment plan while working for an eligible employer. And that eligible employer is going to be either a 501c3, or um, a state, uh, local, federal, tribal government, so public service. And what you do is not as important as who you're doing it for. So, you know, anybody working in a school system, whether it's the custodian or a, a fifth grade teacher, if you are working full time and you're in an income driven repayment plan, then you can be working your way toward public service loan forgiveness at the end of 120 eligible payments. Um, teacher loan forgiveness, obviously a little different. This is loan forgiveness if you teach full time for five complete and consecutive academic years as a highly qualified teacher in a low income school or educational service agency. You need to have borrowed your first loan on or after October 1st, 1998. And you could have up to 17,500 forgiven on subsidized and subsidized and unsubsidized Stafford loans. We actually get a lot of questions about teacher loan forgiveness at FAME, so you can always give our 800 number a call if you ever have any questions. Our education customer service team um, is very well versed in this program. Other types of cancellation are total and permanent disability and then cancellation due to death. And obviously we'd hate to see anyone have to access these last two types of cancellation, but they do exist and they are important for many reasons. So um, just like Myla, here is a real person. Um, this is their studentaid.gov uh, dashboard. I've blocked out their name, but I wanted you to be able to see, in this case, the person isn't filing a FAFSA, they've already graduated. You can see that their servicer is Mohila. You can see what their principal balance is and how much, how much interest actually has already accrued on this loan. But their studentaid.gov is the place where they could go into the loan simulator, they could apply for an income driven repayment plan. If they are not already um, in a direct loan consolidation, they could do that. But the most important thing here is probably the PSLF help tool because I'm talking to all of you as educators, I'm assuming there's a lot of people here that will be interested in PSLF. So determine whether you work for a qualifying employer by using the PSLF help tool. It's actually, I think, a really handy, easy tool to use. Um, you can learn the steps that you can take to become eligible for PSLF, and there is a guided form and submission process. Now, my own experience with PSLF happens to be with helping my daughter. As I mentioned, she's working with a 501c3, so she's a public service loan forgiveness pursuer, if you will. Um, and in her case, she, is at a, she was able to document that she's at a qualifying employer. She is in an income-driven repayment plan. And what was really great is when she did her form for her employer certification, she was able to directly email it to the HR office for her employer. So she actually didn't have to um, download, print, and sign, and then upload a form or bring it over to HR. So um, it's been beneficial in her case. In some cases, you will have to print a form, bring it to HR, have them sign it, and then you can upload it. But all of those functionalities are working. And as I've mentioned, Mohila is the public service loan forgiveness servicer for all federal student loan borrowers who are pursuing PSLF. This happens to be a screenshot that shows you what you see when you first log in to Mohila for PSLF. You can see if, you're, if you've got a payment due, you can look at your payment history. And then down at the bottom of this screenshot, you can also see if you're enrolled in auto debit. I like to show the Mohila screenshots because sometimes I feel like when we counsel people, it feels a little bit like we're talking about a black hole. So it's really nice when we can show you what we're talking about. 
So again, when you click on public service loan forgiveness, when you're in the Mohila dashboard, you can track your loan forgiveness progress. You can certify your eligible employment. We recommend that you certify at least annually. You don't have to, but I think that's a little bit of a dangerous game because you'd really want to make sure if you were going to run into any issues. So if you certify annually, then there's no surprises. So we definitely recommend certifying annually. You can't see it on the screenshot that I provided, but the loan overview at the very bottom with the balance overview and account summary, this would also be the place that will show you the payment plan that you're in. So are you in the safe plan? Are you in standard repayment? Are you in graduated repayment? So again, lots of great information available. This happens to be what Mohila looks like, and that's because I assumed many of you are interested in PSLF, but you'll see something a little different if your dashboard is with Nelnet or if your dashboard is with Advantage. Every system can be a little different. Just a couple more things about public service loan forgiveness. When you click on the payment tracker down at the very bottom, you can see payment counts, eligible, pay eligible payments, ineligible payments, and employment. Those are all of the tabs that you can click into for this borrower. Um, I clicked into the payment counts, so you can see that this borrower already has 10 payments toward public service loan forgiveness. That's great out of the 120. But I think what was even more important, if you look at the ineligible payment, that's the one that's highlighted in white. You can see the little carrot pointing to it. This borrower actually has four payments that have been listed as not eligible due to forbearance. So this person will want to make sure that they pursue whether or not they requested that forbearance. So is this a forbearance they asked for or because of where we are with student loans entering repayment and lots of administrative forbearances being applied. If this is an administrative forbearance, they'll want to make sure that Mohila reverses that. So I just wanted to make sure people understood there's a lot of great information if you're pursuing public service loan forgiveness. So spend some time poking around Mohila if you haven't and you are pursuing public service loan forgiveness. So just a little bit more about forgiveness and cancellation, go to studentaid.gov PSLF. There actually is a very, very good Q&A out there. Um, I think the Department of Education has come miles with how they administer public service loan forgiveness. I know they're in the middle of a bumpy time with FAFSA, but there have been such great improvements made overall. And one of them being that FAFSA was combined with studentaid.gov. I think that's great. There's one login where you can see everything. I can log into studentaid.gov, believe it or not, and I can see my student loans from 1985. Um, they show paid in full, so I'm very grateful that that's the right status. But I just think that's so incredible that from 1985, I can see my student loans um, from when I was an undergraduate. And so that's that's amazing. And I think it's a really, really good and important improvement. And we will get through the FAFSA hurdle soon. So I did have some people ask me, um, especially at Fame, hey, did you hear about the new cancellation? Well, you know, this seems like there's something in the news every other day about student loan cancellation. I will say what that was at the time the person was asking me was that um, in February of 2024, the White House and the Department of Education announced another expanded opportunity at student loan cancellation. It is just an announcement and they are not even close to finalizing it. And some people are predicting that it will face legal challenges, but the new cancellation being pursued is through an expansive definition of economic hardship. So some of the things they're looking at, are you likely to default within two years? What is the loan balance compared to this, the borrower's income? Do you have unavoidable high expenses such as childcare or healthcare? Are there other factors we should be considering like the age of the borrower, your repayment history, and maybe a disability that wasn't allowed through the disability um, and discharge cancellation? So that's the one that you've heard about in the last couple months. There was another big announcement yesterday, and uh, Mickey and I were talking about that one. Basically, that was the White House announcing that public service loan forgiveness has been calculated and finalized for, oh, I'm going to get the number wrong, but tens of thousands of borrowers, let's say. And so they were just announcing that that forgiveness was actually being applied yesterday. So people could have seen their balances basically go down to zero because it was determined that they hit 120. They were at an eligible employer. And then next week, they will actually get um, emails directly from studentaid.gov indicating whether or not they qualified for, well, not whether or not, 
indicating when they qualified for that total forgiveness. So that was what you probably heard in the news yesterday. That's not new, but it's just basically a new batch, if you will, of forgiveness that just got applied. So it is really exciting. We're always monitoring that. We've seen it happen with people we know. Um, and it's so thrilling to watch, you know, just the weight that gets lifted off their shoulders. Um, there's nothing quite like it. So federal loan consolidation, just remember, um, federal loan consolidation is different than refinancing. Now you can refinance your federal student loans into a private refinance student loan, but you want to be very careful before you do something like that because you're basically paying off the federal loans and all the benefits that go with them no longer exist. So refinance is not a bad thing if that's the thing that's going to help you hit your goals and you're not trying to pursue public service loan forgiveness, you're not trying to pursue 20 or 25 year forgiveness on federal student loans, um, or that you're not going to go back to school, you aren't anticipating an economic hardship deferment. So just think very carefully before you try to quote refinance federal student loans. Having said that, federal consolidation, federal loan consolidation is something very different. And that allows you to take your federal education loans and combine them into one new direct consolidation loan for the purpose of lowering your monthly payment, or as you heard me say a couple of slides ago, for gaining access to federal forgiveness programs. So the pros are you've got a single payment with one monthly bill, a lower monthly payment, access to additional repayment plans and or forgiveness and a fixed interest rate. The cons are the longer you're in repayment, the more accrued interest you might have, and you might lose certain borrower benefits even within a federal loan consolidation. But just recall what I said about the SAVE plan. You can actually be someone who is in the SAVE plan with a direct consolidation loan, and if you're paying your calculated monthly payment on time and it's not covering the interest, the interest is being forgiven. So there are still going to be some um, nice benefits for federal direct loan consolidation, depending on your situation and what your calculated monthly payment um, is based on the SAVE plan. So again, not necessarily a bad thing, just things we want you to weigh carefully. Um, one thing I didn't mention earlier, and I will mention it now, and it, it's called double secret consolidation. <laughs> Myla's la laughing because, so the PLUS loan, parent loan for undergraduate students, Plus loans are not eligible for the SAVE plan. However, we discovered that when you consolidate a PLUS loan into a direct consolidation loan, it retains a trait that says it's still a PLUS loan, even though it's now part of a consolidation loan. If you leave one little PLUS loan off to the side when you do that consolidation, and then you reconsolidate your new consolidation loan with that one little plus loan that you left off to the side or other federal loan you left off to the side, when you consolidate that second time, it removes the plus trait and now the loan becomes eligible for the SAVE program. So we call it double secret consolidation. It really isn't a secret. More and more people are starting to figure it out. We actually didn't even know it existed until last summer. It's very beneficial for someone who's dealing with very high um, public um, for very high plus loan debt. Um, so just something to keep in mind if that's a situation that you're in or someone you know is in that situation. Again, it's going away July 1st, 2025. It will no longer be available, but I highly recommend go ahead and write to your federal delegation and see whether or not plus loans can be eligible for the safe plan, regardless of whether or not they're consolidated. Um, that's certainly something that as a taxpayer and a citizen you could pursue. So tax credits, just remember we're talking about student loan repayment. There are other tax credits that are available if you're actually in the midst of paying tuition. So we're just talking about student loan repayment programs. And in Maine, we have the former Opportunity Maine. It's still called Opportunity Maine. And you can get great information at Live and Work in Maine. But that is actually a tax credit. And tax credit is a dollar for dollar reduction of your tax obligation. So it's a very rich benefit on your taxes. And it's only just on your Maine state taxes. Um, for $2,500 a year based on your student loan payments for college graduates who live and work here, and it's a $25,000 lifetime maximum. Um, the Maine.gov revenue form is available, so when you file your state taxes, you can claim that credit if you're eligible. But again, a great program for the state of Maine, and actually many states throughout the nation are talking about this because it is considered a very rich tax benefit. The other tax benefit we want people to be aware of is federal um, 
federal tax, also on your federal taxes, student loan interest deduction. So a deduction is different than a credit. A deduction reduces the income that you're taxed on. A credit reduces your actual tax obligation. So deductions are great. They're not as great as a tax credit, but don't, um, don't snub your nose at them. Go ahead and take advantage of any tax credits and tax deductions that you can. Um, they're really important for helping to pay the bill, if you will, even on the back end. And then last but not, well, not last but not least, we've got a couple more slides, but the big picture. These are things that will be um, things you want to take into consideration for your situation. And every situation is unique and deserves unique attention. So considerations, what is your overall financial situation, all of your debt, your income, your budget, do you want to pay off loans or do you want a lower monthly payment so you can begin investing or do you want to do a little bit of both? Do you want to refinance or do you want to consolidate? Um, sadly, we are in a time in our nation where politics and student loans are uh, very much intertwined. So you do need to pay attention to the political scene as it relates to student loans. And then certainly issues around bankruptcy and student loans. Um, it is not easy to get student loans discharged in bankruptcy. It is not impossible, but it is not something I would count on. There are many, many factors um, in play and it's not, um, I, don't want to, I don't want to imply that bankruptcy is easy for anybody when you're having any kind of debt discharged, but student loans in particular, there are different qualifications and criteria that have to be met before a student loan can be forgiven or canceled due to bankruptcy. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at your big picture, your goals, your dreams, your specific information. And then remember, we've got tons of additional resources that we want you to take advantage of. So repay restart, famemain.com forward slash repay restart. Visit our financial wellness page. We really recommend fame.enrich.org. That's going to be a great resource. Again, it's a free financial education digital platform. We pay for it on behalf of all people in Maine. When you get a user ID and password, your information is not sold. It is not sent to be marketed to. And the information you get is customized based on what you are interested in learning about. We also contract with ECMC for student loan counseling. That is very proactive counseling. So they will look at people who are about to go into repayment or who just entered repayment. So new borrowers, if you will, new graduates and they will proactively reach out to them about um, their student loans and managing repayment. And then we currently spend a lot of time working with the Institute for Student Loan Advisors. I would think of that as more reactionary. So if you are in repayment, you have been for a while, but you have questions, you can actually email um, freestudentloanadvice.org and get your questions answered. They don't charge anything. They are nonpartisan. They, you know, they, they are not pushing anything. There's no advertisers. Um, so freestudentloanadvice.org, we use, we use Betsy, the, um, the executive director of this organization, all the time. She is a treasure. She is a national expert. So definitely take advantage of um, the resources of the student, the Institute for Student Loan Advice. And then the U.S. Department of Education does have an ombudsman group. And so if there's ever any problems with your federal student loans or you have a dispute that you think you need to um, issue, then you can actually do that through the Ombudsman's Office. So FSA Ombudsman Office at ed.gov, and they will help resolve any student loan disputes you might have. Maybe your servicer calculated something wrong and they're just not seeing their mistake and you need FSA to intervene. So um, that is another resource that is available to you. And then uh, last but not least, you can always email us at education at famemain.com or our 800 number, 800-228-3734. We also have TTY um, available as well. And you can also join um, and connect with us through our join page, famemain.com join, where we will email or text you with important information, whether it's about the financial aid process or updated information about student loans. So again, consider joining um, our information page, if you will. And that's it. Myla, do we have any questions? I didn't stop this whole time and that's so unfair. We may have had questions. <laughs> No, we had a we had a few, but I think I took care of them. Um, you know, things like you do want to if you're pursuing public service loan forgiveness, you do want to 
uh, do your employer certification every single year, ideally. Uh, it's yeah. not required that you do it annually, but it's beneficial to. And like you showed at the beginning, Martha, um, what's nice on Mohila is you can see, my son's in the same situation, but you can see the payments that have um, already been you know, certified and are counting and you can see your current status. And we have had situations where you know, sometimes employers do go away. So we, we want people to make sure that they're doing that on an annual basis is the ideal. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a tremendous point, which is, you know, you might be working for a lovely 501c3, you were full time, and for whatever reason, that 501c3 ended up closing its doors. And if that's already happened, then you can't necessarily go back and get an old employer certification. So again, yeah, I recommend that you do your employer certification annually, especially if you're able to take advantage of the email option where the certification is emailed to your HR department. And even if it's not, it is so worth the, the extra time to print the form, bring it to HR, sign it, upload it. And you can upload it either through studentaid.gov or directly with Mohila. So, you know, there are options to get that done. And, you know, I think how much easier it is, I, I think a lot of people on here probably are looking at public service loan forgiveness or are, have people that they're working with who are. And, you know, the same thing that we saw in the FAFSA, where if you provide consent, your information is uploaded automatically or transferred automatically from the IRS. That same thing happens um, on the PSLF side um, or any of the income-based repayments, I mean. So it's it's just, it's really a lot quicker and easier than it used to be. So, um, so yeah, we really recommend that people check that out. And if you do run into trouble, let us know. It's, it's helpful for us to know what works and it's helpful for us to know what doesn't work <laughs> and where there are issues and we can we can try to support you through um, any of those challenges. And and my and Myla is absolutely right. I think when I helped my daughter do the safe plan, it went too smoothly. And I thought, was that right? <laughs> <laughs> and it was. And, and it was. <laughs> Great. Yes, and, well, and Morgan's just mentioning that um, that she had the same thing happen. That she highly recommends um, certified employment annually, as well as I attempted to contact a former employer, but they shred their um, employee records after ten after seven years, right? So that's a really really good point, Morgan. Thank you for mentioning that. That even employers that you know we think they're not going to go away, right? They're going to be here forever. Yeah, uh, many many places have a seven year retention record. So that's a that's a really great point, Morgan. Yeah, thank you for making that because you're right. Um, well, I thank everybody for joining us today. And please, I do encourage you, as Myla said, you know, certainly reach out education at fanmain.com. Let us know what's working, what's not working. Um, we're lucky we have a couple of our own kiddos paying back student loans and pursuing public service loan forgiveness. So they definitely are the guinea pigs for us. And, you know, I'm kind of sad I don't have them to file a FAFSA for. I was going to say, we <laughs> can't do a FAFSA anymore for them, but we have the other side of things now, right? Yeah, exactly. So, well, thank you, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and turn off our recording. And um, I hope you all have a great day. Myla, I don't know if you want to give any yeah. directions for the next Yeah, thing. so back to that agenda. Um, let's see if I can... If you stop sharing, Martha, I think I can. Okay, let me see if I can get to my.